Bene, buonasera a tutti. Non è vietato di venire un po' più avanti, penso, non è così pericoloso qui, qui giù. Eh, egregio direttore generale, egregio rettore dell'Università della Svizzera Italiana, gentili signore, egregi signori, cari colleghi, cari colleghe, è un grande piacere di darvi il benvenuto alla nostra Lecture of the Year. Il programma è uh, una breve uh, introduzione dal uh, uh, professor Bassetti sulla fondazione e la motivazione di questa lettura di ieri. Dopo farò un'introduzione sul tema e siamo naturalmente molto molto lieti che il professor Mark Hallett sia venuto degli Stati Uniti e ha accettato la nostra, il nostro uh, invito per fare questa presentazione. Vorrei incominciare con la prima parte e prego il professor Bassetti di venire. Grazie Alain, eh, do anch'io il saluto al Rettore, al Direttore Generale, a tutte le autorità, ma soprattutto anche ai colleghi e eh, alle colleghe. Eh, sono molto contento che per l'ottava lettura siamo eh, qui con l'università. Eh, L'idea di questa lettura era un'idea accademica, universitaria, per cui per la prima volta siamo qui e spero che anche in futuro avremo l'occasione di tornarci. Um, eh, rappresento qui eh, la volontà di due fondazioni che si sono investite negli anni per promuovere le neuroscienze nel cantone e eh, inizio con la fondazione Eccles che eh, sostiene la lettura è una fondazione che è stata eh, fondata dal signor Leoni, che questa sera purtroppo non c'è, ma che è il deus ex machina della fondazione. È una fondazione che vuole eh, mettere in dialogo, se volete, le scienze dure, le scienze molli, insomma le, le scienze, le neuroscienze, diciamo, che fa Kellen, che faccio io, che fa il professor Ed, ma anche la filosofia e la psicologia e le scienze umanistiche e eh, nel consiglio vedete rappresentate appunto queste diverse sensibilità. Questa fondazione eh, propone eh, nel cantone dei simposi che avete forse anche potuto eh, visitare, abbiamo fatto ad esempio un paio di anni fa una, un grosso simposio sulle, sui circuiti cerebrali eh, che eh, governano le emozioni e eh, proprio con il consiglio che saluto e in particolare il professor Martinoni che anche lui è dall'inizio ma anche gli altri membri del consiglio eh, sono presenti in parte, il professor Fariello e ehm, altri, eh, vedete che abbiamo previsto anche per quest'anno un simposio dove effettivamente avremo la possibilità di eh, avere questo dialogo con ingegneri, matematici, neuroscienziati, filosofi eccetera. Adesso, eh, oggi, come ho detto, è l'ottava lettura, adesso non vi voglio ripresentare gli oratori, questa sera è il nostro piacere di avere il professor Hellet, so I'm really pleased that you accepted our invitation to come back to Switzerland. I think that Alain will uh, say more than I will and want to do now, but I, just joking before starting uh, this session, we said you may need at one point the Swiss citizenship because uh, so many Swiss have came to your place to do the training and you have accepted so many times to come to Switzerland that uh, depending on the political situation you may want to consider the possibility of uh, maybe accepting uh, uh, some time too. I'm joking but we are really pleased that you're here and, and I will say certainly more. Uh, come vedete abbiamo avuto il piacere di avere un po' tutte le discipline delle neuroscienze ed è, eh, vorrei sottolinearlo, la scelta del direttore, dunque del professor Kellen, di chi invitare, dunque sono molto evidentemente contento della scelta, ma eh, noi offriamo il sostegno, ma la scelta viene fatta dal professor Kellen. La seconda fondazione, che questa sera poi ehm, eh, darà il premio, eh, è nata per mia iniziativa nel 2012, è una fondazione che eh, ha come scopo il sostegno più diretto delle neuroscienze ehm, eh, cliniche e sperimentali e eh, qui voglio ringraziare e salutare le due persone che in questa fondazione sono state dall'inizio di grandissimo sostegno e eh, anche qui Deus ex machine 
e che sono il dottor Barazzoni e il dottor Maggini e saluto anche come nuovo membro, non ancora ufficialmente sulla diapositiva, il professor Rusconi. Ecco, la Fondazione fa dei simposi e quest'anno vi inviteremo a fine mese per un simposio sull'epilessia e qui eh, avremo come sempre degli oratori del Neurocentro eh, che vengono da fuori Ticino, tipicamente dalla Svizzera e dall'Italia e il professor Kellin modererà eh, con me la serata e anche la discussione finale. Questa fondazione dell'ultima diapositiva dà ogni anno un premio per la migliore pubblicazione scientifica, la scelta viene fatta sulla base delle pubblicazioni che ci vengono inviate di lavori fatti da ticinesi o in Ticino, abbiamo un comitato scientifico, vi ho presentato, che fa la valutazione e quest'anno ho il grande piacere di eh, salutare come nuovo premiato la signora Sgroi, non so ancora se ha finito il dottorato, è dottoressa Sgroi, che è una collaboratrice da sempre del professor Kelly, che ha vinto dunque la corsa, per così dire, con eh, chi ha eh, sottomesso la sua candidatura con un lavoro eh, sperimentale sulla malattia di Parkinson e di scinesia e credo che Alain eh, farà una breve presentazione. Dunque sono molto contento di eh, salutarvi e della presenza del professor Elet e eh, così detto do nuovamente la parola al professor Kelly per l'introduzione del nostro eh, conferenziere. Grazie. Sì, questo è il, è il uh, nostro, nostro programma. Volevo soltanto anche aggiungere che abbiamo uh, per l'aperitivo anche il sostegno della, della ditta uh, uh, Merz e uh, ci sarà un apero alla, alla fine della, della giornata. Ma adesso è un uh, grande piacere, ma soprattutto un grande onore di poter fare l'introduzione e la laudazio del professor uh, Mark Hallett. Mark Hallett è uno dei più famosi neurologi al mondo che ha molto contribuito allo sviluppo dei disturbi del movimento, della, della scienza dei disturbi del uh, movimento nella neurologia moderna. E quest'anno uh, c'è un giubileo, i disturbi del movimento esistono da sempre, ma 200 anni fa c'è stata la prima descrizione della malattia di Parkinson. James Parkinson, che non era un neurologo, non esistavano dei neurologi a quell'epoca, era un medico di famiglia, per la prima volta ha descritto la malattia come un'entità separata. Ha parlato di shaking palsy, paralisi sagittans, e penso questo dimostra molto bene eh, i disturbi del movimento. Da un lato mancano i movimenti, Volontari, la paralisi e dall'altro dei movimenti involontari, shaking, il tremore. I disturbi del movimento esistono da molto tempo, ci sono state anche descrizioni prima. Anche Leonardo da Vinci, quando si vede la sua faccia nella vecchiaia, si pensa che forse anche lui aveva una malattia di Parkinson. Ma questa è una descrizione da lui dove descrive un paziente con un, con un tremore. E la cosa interessante è nella frase eh, senza il controllo dell'anima, anima che nonostante tutte le sue forze non può evitare che queste parti tremino. E questo è l'aspetto molto importante, disturbi del movimento, un movimento patologico, ma anche l'aspetto del controllo motorio, come il cervello controlla i movimenti, come e quando il cervello perde il controllo dei movimenti. E questo aspetto del motor control è stato sempre una priorità e una motivazione per il professor Mark Hallett. Le, la neurologia, le neuroscienze cliniche, possiamo dire, abbiamo incominciato dopo, eh, dopo eh, Parkinson, dopo James Parkinson, cioè soprattutto in uh, Francia il... Uh, Uh, professor Charcot, che ha incominciato a descrivere bene le malattie. E qui, uh, se si voleva capire cosa succede nel cervello, 
bisognava aspettare il decesso del paziente, vedere cosa c'è nel cervello e dopo provare di fare una correlazione e così che si è scoperto la, la sclerosi multipla eh, per esempio con questa eh, descrizione famosa eh, nel 1868. Vuol dire questo è l'inizio della neurologia e anche Charcot che ha proposto la parola malattia di Parkinson, vuol dire riconoscendo che ci sono delle malattie specifiche che hanno dei sintomi del sistema eh, motorio, ma alla stessa epoca è stata fatta questa, questa pittura famosa, eh, il, il dottore, si potrebbe dire il neurologo, no? e forse è un molto, dottore molto bravo, ma non, ho, non è che questa persona possa fare eh, granché. Una medicina, diciamo, descrittiva, che fa delle buone diagnosi, che è capace di, fare, di capire quale parte del cervello fa quale sintomo, ma eh, eh, questa non è sufficiente. Come sapete tutti, è molto cambiata da quel tempo, c'è stata una rivoluzione, rivoluzione in tutta la medicina, ma soprattutto nella, nella neurologia, con l'attacco, la, 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 la con la risonanza magnetica, eh, non dobbiamo più eh, aspettare l'autopsia. C'è stata questa esplosione delle conoscenze, questa eh, importanza sempre di più della tecnologia e con la conseguenza della sottospecializzazione. Conseguenza positiva, conseguenza anche negativa, la medicina interna adesso non c'è più come c'era un tempo fa, c'è la cardiologia, c'è la nefrologia e penso che la neurologia adesso fa lo stesso sviluppo. Non è più possibile per un neurologo di controllare tutte le conoscenze che, che esistono. E in questo, questo ambito, negli ultimi diciamo, 20-30 anni, i disturbi del movimento si sono sempre più sviluppati con una, come una sottodisciplina delle, della eh, neurologia. Non vuol dire che non siamo più eh, dei diagnostici, penso che questo è, sarebbe un grande errore, è molto importante, è molto importante anche nel nostro neurocentro, rimane il medico che deve esaminare il paziente, ma la facciamo molto meglio, abbiamo la medicina basata sull'evidenza, abbiamo le linee guide internazionali che ci permettono di definire meglio cosa è una patologia precisa, cosa è un parkinsonismo, cosa è un parkinsonismo atipico, per esempio. Tutto questo sembra a un giovane neurologo evidente, in realtà è molto recente. Vent'anni fa non esistevano questi, questi criteri diagnostici, queste conferenze di consenso, eccetera. Naturalmente, come lo sapete, abbiamo delle tecniche di neuroimaging molto, molto potenti, possiamo non soltanto cercare la lesione, ma anche eh, vedere il funzionamento del cervello. Qui sono due esempi di, del, del nostro eh, riparto di neuroradiologia, con del funzional, funzional neuroimaging e qui eh, della, eh, ciò che si chiama la trattografia, per vedere un po' le connessioni. Tecniche moderne che permettano di capire il cervello, non soltanto le patologie, ma anche il funzionamento normale del cervello. Una tecnica che è meno conosciuta qui è la eh, stimolazione magnetica transcranica. Questa è un'immagine un degli NIH, di uno dei laboratori del professor Markalet con un fellow. E si stimola la cortice con una, una bobina e come si vede una persona, un soggetto sano o un paziente può senza rischio ricevere questa stimolazione. Si stimola la cortice motoria o, o alt anche altre parti in questo caso si guarda l'influenza sul uh, sistema motorio, sulla mano, e, uh, e qui il uh, professor Macalet ha dato un enorme uh, contributo. A livello terapeutico, naturalmente, abbiamo delle medicine, ma c'è anche una, un aspetto, una rivoluzione in realtà nel trattamento di diversi uh, crampi, come la, la distonia, come la spasticità, sono le iniezioni di tossine botulinica. Si pensa oggi ah, ma è per la cosmetica, per le rughe, in realtà ci sono delle malattie dove vent'anni fa il paziente doveva essere operato, si doveva uh, togliere dei muscoli perché il crampo era troppo forte. Oggi possiamo fare delle, delle iniezioni con un, un tasso di successo molto elevato, anche questo lo facciamo nel nostro neurocentro. 
e anche una delle rivoluzioni degli ultimi vent'anni è la stimolazione cerebrale profonda. Possiamo provare di correggere il disturbo del movimento dove incomincia, vuol dire nel cervello, con delle eh, elettrodi che stimolano i centri, i centri eh, eh, motori. Naturalmente in tutta questa evoluzione ci sono state tante persone, uno dei fondatori anche era il professor Marsden a, a Londra, dove anche Mark Hallett è stato durante la sua, la sua fondazione, ma possiamo dire che in ogni di queste parti c'è stato un contributo del uh, professor Mark Hallett. Soltanto un esempio, la stimolazione eh, magnetica transcranica, anche perché abbiamo lavorato insieme su questo quando ero nella, lì, eh, NIH, e qui, come detto, una scarica in una bobina induce un campo magnetico nella cortice che influenza. E si può fare sia una, una stimolazione unica, c'è cioè una risposta muscolare, come si vede qua, Qui è la risposta elettrica del muscolo, qui abbiamo l'accelerazione, la direzione del, del movimento. Ma la cosa ancora più interessante, quasi, perché apre delle porte anche a livello cognitivo, a livello non motorio, si può con la simulazione ripetitiva fare un'inibizione di una zona. Si può fare come una lesione virtuale e vedere se una zona cerebrale gioca un ruolo. E questa è, è la fisiologia, non è soltanto guardare se una parte del cervello è distrutta e questo correla con un sintomo, ma qui si prova veramente di capire cosa succede del, nel cervello, la fisiologia, che è una delle sfide le più importanti eh, nella neurologia e nei disturbi del movimento. E Mark Hallett qui eh, non si è mai limitato a, tra virgolette, soltanto provare di capire le malattie, ma anche di provare a capire il funzionamento più anche fisiologico del cervello. E c'è uno studio sulla libertà, per esempio, dove avevamo provato di vedere se con questa stimolazione transcranica possiamo influenzare la scelta libera di una, di una persona. Qui era semplice, doveva scegliere se faccio un movimento della mano a sinistra o a destra. Abbiamo provato di vedere se possiamo perturbare e quando eh, il risultato era negativo. Non siamo riusciti a, a ciò che è bello per la, per la libertà di scelta. Questo è soltanto un esempio e quando si prova di fare un riassunto di tutto ciò che Mark Aletta ha fatto negli, negli ultimi anni è molto difficile. Questo è il biosketch che lui mi ha, mi ha dato ha fatto la sua formazione a Harvard, ha fatto anche dei soggiorni dopo eh, a Londra, eh, per esempio da, da professor Marsden, come detto, era anche uno degli altri pionieri della, dei disturbi del movimento, è stato il capo della neurofisiologia eh, a Harvard Medical School, L'aspetto neurofisiologico, il funzionamento è sempre importante, è dal 1984 è al National Institute of Health a Bethesda, vuol dire un istituto federale medicale americano. Ha lavorato e lavora moltissimo a livello internazionale, penso che questa lista non è completa, è presidente di diverse stato e presidente di tante eh, associazioni che hanno fatto e che fanno avanzare la neurologia moderna. Viene da Lugano, non direttamente dagli Stati Uniti, ma dalla Germania, da Hamburgo, e ha ricevuto qui un, un dottor honoris causa, anche in riconoscimento del suo enorme contributo, e per ciò che ho aggiunto il secondo titolo, molto recente, qualche giorno fa, per ciò che anche non è nel, nel vostro eh, programma. Naturalmente con questa attività c'è anche una lista di pubblicazioni importante, più di 400 articoli. Ho guardato i tre articoli i più citati di Mark Hallett nel Web of Science e si vede questi tre articoli che sono delle linee guide e si vede che questo primo prima articolo è stato citato 1700 volte. E penso che ci sono, non c'è una linea guida nei disturbi del movimento che utilizziamo come medico ogni giorno con un nostro paziente dove non c'è stato un contributo di Mark Hallett per correggere, per dare un input. 
ci sono tanti altri articoli, ma lì il, il fatto di introdurre la stimolazione magnetica transcranica, di provare a capire il funzionamento del cervello sano con questa tecnica ha permesso di ap aprire diverse porte e qui sono tre articoli su questo, anche degli articoli che hanno più di, più di, di 20 anni, come, come questo, citato, non si vede bene, ma più di 400 volte, che hanno, che hanno creato una rivoluzione, hanno permesso per la prima volta, era possibile, di, di, di stimolare il cervello. È una tecnica che è complementaria alla, altre tecniche come, come il neuroimaging. Ma c'è un altro aspetto che è probabilmente ancora più importante, che è la lista delle pubblicazioni. Penso uh, che non c'è un grande centro neurologico al mondo dove non c'è almeno un neurologo che non uh, ha avuto Mark Hallett come, come docente. E anche in Svizzera, come Claudio Bassetti ha detto, c'è tanta gente, ci sono tanti neurologi che hanno potuto andare agli uh, NIH. So, questi, questi sono soltanto un esempio, so, sono i neurologi attuali, ce ne sono altri. Dottor Benninger a, a Losanna, al CIV, professor Bolhalter a Lucerna, Daniel Waldvogel anche a Lucerna, ma anche a Zurigo come consulenza esterna, professor eh, eh, Peter Fur a, a Basilea e anch'io che ho avuto la fortuna e il privilegio di poter lavorare dal 99 al 2001, abbiamo soprattutto lavorato insieme in, in clinica e anche in uh, stimolazione magnetica transcranica. And now I would like to switch to English to thank you for coming to, to uh, Switzerland. We are very pleased that you are, you are here and you accepted our invitation. And I would like also to express my deep gratitude for giving me the chance at that time to come to the, to the NIH. We are looking forward to hear your lecture now. Thank you very much for that uh, very nice introduction. Uh, I'm, of course, very pleased to uh, be here. Uh, it is an honor to, to give this talk, and uh, I'm happy to uh, talk about different aspects of motor control. I was very happy to uh, see that uh, this particular session is named, to some extent, after John Eccles. Uh, when I was uh, starting out in motor control, uh, I went to different meetings. Eccles did come to those meetings, so I did uh, know him. Uh, and uh, as I will uh, show you a little bit later, I think actually one of the reasons that I chose the topic that I did, it's not only because I have an interest in this uh, topic, but because I wanted to tie Eccles uh, into the story in some way. And you've already heard a little bit, I suppose, about why I've done that. So uh, I'm going to talk about functional movement disorders. And uh, I'm going to talk uh, about the physiology uh, of them, uh, trying to give you some understanding, as we have at the moment, about these different disorders. Uh, just to say at the outset that they are extremely common problems. Um, these, are, these are disorders that uh, approximately, say, 10% of uh, new patients that come into a general neurology office uh, have uh, functional neurological disorders of some sort. And since I'm a movement disorder doctor, I'll talk to you about the movement disorders, but they are really pervasive in uh, all areas. Um, so I just wanted to show you uh, just a couple of patients to make sure we're on the same wavelength. Um, functional gait disorders are uh, relatively common. I just keep on going a little further. And uh, this is a patient that uh, claims to have poor balance when she's walking. Uh, okay, turn around and come on back now. Of course, in order to be able to uh, walk this way, you have to have very good balance, and uh, that's one of the clues to the, to the particular problem that she has. Um, this is sometimes goes by the term astasia abasia, um, sort of funny gaits of various kinds, 
that are not due to an organic uh, problem. And uh, here's another patient uh, who has a functional tremor. Um, it's uh, paroxysmal in nature. It comes and goes uh, very, very frequently. It uh, doesn't obey the rules of a Parkinson tremor or an essential tremor or any other type of uh, organic tremor that we know. Uh, it seems to go on for a while and then she gets fatigued uh, and stops and then gets a little bit of energy back and it uh, comes back again. Uh, there's different shaking of different parts of the body uh, at uh, different times and again doesn't follow any of the rules of organic disorder. And uh, <clears throat> these, these disorders are involuntary in, in nature uh, and uh, these people uh, have a great deal of disability. And the question is, uh, uh, how can we understand these particular problems? And uh, that's going to be the essence of what I'm going to be talking about. In terms of psychiatric classification, I mean, these, these particular disorders are of presumed psychiatric uh, origin. Um, and this is the psychiatric classification into which they fit, uh, somatic symptom and related disorder uh, under the DSM-5 categorization. These are the different entities in that list. And uh, there are two of them, uh, which I've highlighted in red, which are relevant to the differential diagnosis of these patients. Uh, one is conversion disorder or functional neurological symptom disorder. The other is factitious disorder. And there's one other entity that's not actually on this list, but I've listed at the bottom malingering, which also comes into the differential diagnosis. And in the next slides, I'll just uh, go over these three entities so you know what we're talking about in a little more detail. Conversion disorder uh, is by far the most common. Uh, one of the old names is hysteria, but it's been called a variety of things uh, over the years. And it's an unconsciously produced symptom, presumably resulting from a psychological disorder. And the term conversion basically comes from uh, Sigmund Freud. Uh, and the concept here is that the psychological disorder is converted into a somatic symptom as a way of dealing with the disorder. So that's the nature uh, of conversion. It's basically the Freudian hypothesis, and it is the way that people think about uh, this from a psychological or psychiatric point of view, although the basic physiology is uh, still somewhat mysterious, but uh, what we'll be talking about. In any event, that uh, what I've just mentioned is the so-called primary gain of the conversion, and there's also a secondary gain, which is the benefit of being sick. The other entity on the list is factitious disorder. It is also a psychiatric disorder. Um, but in this circumstance, the symptoms are intentionally produced. So this is a voluntary disorder as opposed to an involuntary disorder. These patients have a psychiatric abnormality of some kind, and they intentionally produce their symptoms in order to deal with the psychiatric problem. Uh, this includes Munchausen syndrome. The third entity is malingering. Uh, this is not considered a mental disorder. It wasn't on that list. These people are presumed to have um, fully competent psychiatrically, uh, but they voluntarily produce symptoms like what you saw in order to achieve a specified goal of some kind. Financial compensation, avoidance of work, evasion of criminal prosecution, acquisition of drugs, something of, something of that sort. Um, uh, I think that this particular entity colors the field to some extent. Malingering is rare, uh, but there's a sort of sense among doctors often that all these patients are malingering, uh, but that's not at all true. Just to compare these different entities, uh, conversion and factitious are mental diseases, or medical diseases, 
malingering is not. Uh, and whether it's involuntary or not, it's only conversion. Factitious and malingering are voluntary disorders and conversion is involuntary. Factitious and malingering are rare and almost all the patients that I see in any event have conversion. Uh, and that's what I'm going to be talking about. I'm not going to be talking about the, uh, the other entities uh, today. Now we come to uh, John Eccles. Uh, as I mentioned uh, before, he was a very important uh, person in motor control when I was sort of learning the field. And um, this is a diagram that uh, he had that was a very famous diagram. It appeared in almost everybody's talk. It was in textbooks. Uh, in terms of how the motor system was organized. And um, uh, it uh, had the sort of relevant uh, parts in terms of planning and programming movement, uh, the basal ganglia and the, and, the, and, the, and the cerebellum and the thalamus and the motor cortex, and then the movement would be executed by the motor cortex and the cerebellum produced the movement. But on the left side of the diagram, um, was uh, the idea, and uh, uh, as you see there, um, there's this sort of break in the line uh, from the idea to the rest of the system, and no one really talked about that very much um, in terms of uh, how, this, uh, how this whole thing happened uh, or how this whole thing got, uh, got itself organized. And, uh, this, of course, becomes a critical issue if one is to understand uh, involuntary disorders versus voluntary disorders. Uh, you have to understand uh, how the whole system operates, and um, one has to be able to uh, couple uh, these, these uh, the sort of notion of idea to the rest of the rest of the diagram here. And I think that uh, what this raises is that there's a whole neurology of volitional disorders. Uh, I've called this the neurological disorders of volition, uh, of which uh, conversion is one. Um, uh, so this is, um, this is one of these entities. The movements all look voluntary, but the patients say they're involuntary. And uh, again, that's going to be the theme of what we're going to be talking about, but there, there are more of these uh, issues. Uh, patients that have Tourette syndrome or, or tics, um, the patients often say actually that the movements are voluntary, but then they say that they cannot not make them, whatever that means. Um, Korea, it's uh, very interesting, uh, particularly in Huntington's disease, that early in the illness, patients don't recognize their involuntary movements as being involuntary. Uh, if, if they have an involuntary movement, you ask about it, they say, oh yeah, I'm just scratching the back of my head, something like that. So they believe they're in, in the beginning, they, they think their involuntary movements are actually voluntary. Um, then there's the alien hand phenomenon, where unwanted movements arise without their sense of being willed. Uh, those patients also have difficulty with self-initiated movement. We just saw a patient with this phenomenon just a couple of weeks ago. Again, these patients do arise from time to time, and uh, the woman was very bothered by this. She, her hand would be doing things, and she didn't like it. Uh, the hand would be moving up and doing stuff. Uh, so uh, this is a very bothersome problem to the patients. And almost most interesting is schizophrenia, uh, where uh, in some circumstances the movements may look normal or goal-directed, but if you ask the patient what's going on, the patient will say, I'm not in control, something else is controlling me. I'm, I'm not doing anything voluntarily, I just do what I'm told somehow. So uh, there's uh, then anosognosia, belief that a movement is made when it's not. Um, so there's all sorts of things that uh, go on that, uh, where the sense of voluntariness is important, and I think that uh, it helps to understand this. And as I say, we're going to deal with functional movement disorders and see if that can help us to understand this particular problem. 
um, that uh, Eccles himself had clear difficulty with, uh, as, you, as you see from that diagram. So I'm going to run through a number of different types of movement disorders and uh, uh, tell you what, uh, a little bit about them and what, uh, just a little bit about each in terms of, of what we know about them and how they can inform us on the physiology of these questions. So functional weakness, we'll start with that. And uh, those patients have a decreased recruitment pattern on the EMG, um, just like uh, it would be if effort is in fact reduced. Um, uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation produces normal motor evoked potentials in them. So even if they're completely paralyzed, if you stimulate the motor cortex, the limb moves normally. So the pathway between the motor cortex and the muscle is, is fully normal. But then they have a very funny phenomenon, uh, and that is that the motor evoked potential is suppressed rather than enhanced if there is movement imagination. So if you ask someone to sit there and just imagine that the limb is moving and then you do magnetic stimulation, ordinarily the motor evoked potential goes up. These patients goes down. And uh, this was demonstrated by uh, Achim Liepert, who also was a fellow with us at, at NIH, but he did this work after he left. Um, so this is, uh, this is a motor evoked potential here in a healthy subject. This is at rest. Movement imagination goes up. Very, uh, very, uh, very common phenomenon. It's, it can be easily demonstrated, but in a patient, Sitting there again, motor evoked potential, movement imagination goes down. So uh, a very, a very striking uh, finding. And uh, taking these data together, it shows that the motor executive system in the brain appears to be functioning normally. There's nothing that can be identified problematic between the motor cortex and the muscle. But the abnormality must come from some higher influence on the motor system, something else that is impinging on the motor system, but it can't be the motor system itself because everything that you can look at in that regard uh, seems normal. So next, uh, we look at functional tremor. Um, now, uh, in terms of what this looks like, there can be variability of the frequency of the tremor over time. Um, one of the things which is interesting is that there, can, there is often in these patients exactly the same frequency in different limbs. So if, the, if both arms are shaking, it's exactly the same frequency in the two sides. It may not be well known, but this never happens in Parkinson's disease. It never happens in essential tremor. While they're similar, they're never exactly the same. These patients are exactly the same. You can interrupt the tremor with a quick movement of another limb. So if someone's shaking you, you ask them to make a quick movement to the other side, it stops. That's the same thing would be if you tried that. Uh, if you tried to be shaking and then tried to make a quick move to the other side, you have a temporary stop to the side, which is the same thing that the patients do. And then there is entrainment or substantial alteration with rhythmic tapping of another body part and um, I will show you what that uh, looks like. I need the mouse to move ahead here. So I'll show you what this looks like. This particular woman was sent to us for deep brain stimulation for essential tremor. Uh, she had had uh, tremor for 20 years, uh, refractory to medication, and uh, her referring doctors thought that deep brain stimulation was the next step. And now I'd like you to tap with me using your left hand. Here we go. Right with me. So you can see that the tremor okay, frequency and now you just keep tapping on your own. to the voluntary tapping frequency. And stop. Tap right with me, just when I tap. Here we go. And you keep on tapping. 
All right, well, I think that's, uh, that's fairly clear. That, that's about as clear as you'll see. Everybody's not as clear as that particular patient. It was rather overt. Uh, but it was very easy to make the diagnosis of a functional tremor in this particular circumstance. And what can we conclude from this? Um, that there appears to be a single oscillator for tremor. That is, if it's in the right hand and the left hand, they're going together. They're not, they're not different. There's a single oscillator. And it appears to be shared by the voluntary generator. That if someone is making a voluntary movement, it entrains the, quote, involuntary generator. So there's a single oscillator, and it is shared by a voluntary mechanism of some kind. So the tremor uses voluntary mechanisms in order to go. Now, I'm not saying it's voluntary. It's involuntary, but it's utilizing uh, voluntary mechanisms uh, to make the movement. OK, so the next is functional myoclonus. Um, and uh, in here, uh, uh, many patients that have myoclonus have stimulus-sensitive myoclonus, so that if you give them a stimulus of some sort, they'll have a myoclonic jerk. And uh, in that situation, um, there are variable latencies to the onset of stimulus-induced jerks, greater latencies than that seen in reflex myoclonus of organic type. Latencies are longer than the fastest voluntary reaction time of normal subjects and there are variable patterns of muscle recruitment within each jerk. These all would be similar to what one would see in a voluntary movement or a voluntary reaction. That is, uh, they are around fastest voluntary reaction time. They are, they are somewhat variable in nature. In organic sensory-induced myoclonus, its latency is very short, and it's always the same. So this is, this is very different from, from what you'd see in organic myoclonus. And then there's a normal-looking Breitschaft potential prior to the jerk. And I'll describe that more in just a moment uh, so you know what that means. Let's just take a look at uh, a patient here that has uh, myoclonus. This is a uh, uh, young woman who had uh, myoclonus of her left arm that had developed just two weeks before. Um, and uh, she had a myoclonic reaction to tapping anywhere. And actually, she also had this funny phenomenon that actually helps make the diagnosis that if you occasionally stop the hammer short of contact, they still have the movement, uh, indicating that it's not actually a response to the somatosensory stimulus, but it is a visual visual reaction of some kind. Now, usually you just see that once, but uh, in her it just happened repetitively. So almost didn't have to do anything, and uh, she had the myoclonic movement. This is certainly not anything that you would see in an organic uh, sensory evoked myoclonus. Uh, also, the uh, pattern of uh, tapping almost anywhere in the body uh, produced the myoclonus of the left arm, uh, which again is uh, a rare phenomenon. Um, fortunately, uh, we made the diagnosis in her, and in two weeks, she was uh, all cured of this problem. So in any event, functional myoclonus, if you look at detail at the latencies, uh, here, is a, here is a response to sound at 150 milliseconds, tap of the left finger is 130 milliseconds, all within the range of voluntary reaction times. Uh, in organic myoclonias, this would be down at maybe 30 milliseconds, this would be down at 50 milliseconds. These would also be variable, uh, not so in uh, organic condition, so this is all pretty clear there. And then what about the Breitschaff potential. The Breitschaff potential was first identified by uh, Kornhuber and Dika about uh, 50 years or so ago, and um, they were looking for EEG activity preceding voluntary movement. And they found uh, this slowly rising negativity in the EEG uh, that they called the Breitschaff potential. And uh, this, is, this is an example of it uh, here. 
uh, slowly rising negativity about two seconds or so uh, prior to uh, a movement, which is identified here by the EMG. So this is uh, what one sees in voluntary movements, and uh, it turns out that you see this also in functional myoclonus. You see a Breitschaft potential in that circumstance as well. Again, this is not voluntary, it's involuntary, but the Breitschaft potential that you see with voluntary movement is also seen in functional movement. Now, it helps us make the diagnosis, but uh, then the question is, uh, again, what does this mean? Um, so it appears that myoclonus is a voluntary-like movement, uh, similar to, in fact, reaction time behavior. It uses voluntary mechanisms, and it uses voluntary mechanisms even to the extent that uh, you see something similar to the Breitschaft potential. Work on the Breitschaft potential shows that it largely comes from area six, which is the premotor cortex, so that we, uh, uh, given that the Breitschaft potential is present, we know now also that uh, area six, as well as area four, appear to be functionally normally uh, in this particular situation. Interestingly, it differs from TIC, uh, where the Breitschaft potential is usually absent. So here's a situation where uh, the patients say that it's voluntary, or, uh, but uh, in that circumstance, the Breitschaft potential is often absent. So Breitschaft potential is not an indicator of voluntariness. It is an indicator of activity of area six, present in voluntary movement and present in this circumstance as well. So now I'm going to tell you how the brain makes movements uh, and um, then fit this into the scheme here. So um, the brain uh, does develop intention and, and the intention to move comes from uh, a whole variety of places in the brain. Uh, it comes from the hypothalamus in order to have body homeostasis. Uh, past things that have been rewarded, uh, helped by dopamine, uh, influence the system. Emotions of various kinds coming from the limbic system uh, all help to create movement intention. And then uh, that movement intention gets put into the movement generator system, which includes the premotor and motor cortex, of course, which will then create the movement. Now, from movement intention and movement generation, there are feed-forward signals to the rest of the brain that say, we've decided to make the movement, or the brain has decided to make the movement, the movement's coming. Then, uh, from the movement, <coughs> there's feedback to the brain which uh, says, well, the, some movement occurred. So you have feed-forward signals and feedback signals uh, coming into the brain, and that creates the sense of agency. Agency is the sense that I willed the movement and I did it. So you have to have, I willed it, it happened, I'm the agent of the movement. And uh, that's where, uh, this, that's how uh, I believe, and many other people believe as well, that the sense of willing and agency arise uh, in this particular situation. So what do we know then about functional movement disorders in this circumstance? Uh, that movement generation is normal in them. So looking at this particular system, uh, everything that we've uh, seen shows that the movement generation system is completely normal. It's an involuntary movement, uh, but it uses voluntary mechanisms, and the evidence is pretty strong that that's the case. Now, uh, so I'm going to show you some neuroimaging studies that give us uh, further information about these uh, diagrams that I've just, I'm just showing you. And I'm going to, it's going to lead to two further conclusions. I'm going to give you the conclusions up front. Uh, one is that there's dysfunction of the temporoparietal junction in the brain. And another is there's overactivity of the limbic system. And uh, let me, oh, and uh, I should say that the temporoparietal junction is uh, one of the important areas for agency. 
And I'll, I'll give you evidence for all this. Okay, so uh, where, where is, I was just told you a temporoparietal junction has something to do with agency. What's the evidence for that? Um, there are a number of people that have looked at that. Uh, we've, we've looked at that as well. And this is a paper that uh, Fed and Nahab uh, organized a number of years ago. And uh, in this situation, we did the following experiment. We put, uh, this is a, this is a neuro, neuroimaging study with functional MR. And uh, we had people put their hands into a, into a data glove. And uh, if they move their hand, then it would drive a picture of a hand on a computer screen that they would look at. And um, so uh, this, is the, this is a picture here of the data glove on this side, and this is what they saw uh, when they were looking at the screen. And we gave them some practice for a while, moving the hand, moving the fingers, and uh, watching the picture. And after a while, you feel that you're the agent of what you see on the screen, and of course you are in that circumstance. What you're doing is you are you're driving it, so you develop the sense, sense of agency. Then what you can do is you can change the image to uh, not be exactly what the hand is, but uh, a mixture of what the hand is doing and some arbitrary movements. And you can vary the amount of it so that you can vary the amount of agency that, uh, that people have. So let's just show you uh, what this looks like. So this is, we'll start out with 100% control. This is 100% control. And this is 0% control. And this is 50% control. Just show you quick examples of these. So you get some sense of what they saw. And turns out that people are very good at this. They can, from a, from a behavioral point of view, they can tell you approximately how much agency they've had. Uh, won't go into details here, but the amount of agency and their subjective sense about how much agency they have is very good. And then we can look at the MR uh, and say, well, what are the parts of the brain that modulate with a sense of agency? And uh, here's the picture of that here. Um, these are regions that, uh, that change in the brain with respect to the sense of agency. Now, it's actually a negative correlation, not a positive correlation. So uh, it appears that what the brain is doing is that if you are in fact a normal agent of your movement, the brain is just chugs along fine. But if it's not, if there's a mismatch of some kind, then the brain becomes agitated. And it becomes agitated to the extent that you've lost agency for the movement that you think you've just done. And uh, there's a number of different areas. It's not just a single place. Um, it is a network of regions. But one of the biggest activated areas is the temporoparietal junction. Uh, and uh, uh, this is a, clearly a critical place in relation to the sense of agency. Um, so I'll tell you that uh, FEDA, uh, after about uh, seven years or so, finally finished the next part of uh, the paper, <laughs> which is to look at, it's just been published a couple of days ago. Uh, and uh, very pleased that he's done that. We, we looked at patients with functional movement disorders doing the same task. And um, I'll just go through this uh, quickly. Uh, this is the whole time course of the activation. And in healthy volunteers, which is the data that you just saw, the area of the temporoparietal junction is modulated depending upon the amount of agency. That's what I just showed you. In the patients, it's not modulated. It, uh, it stays about the same. The activation of the temporoparietal junction stays about the same regardless of uh, the amount of agency they have. Those two lines that are uh, off of the group are actually control tests of various kinds. So everything that was actually done is almost all the same there. So they have lost somehow function of the temporoparietal junction 
in terms of even making movements for which they have a certain amount of agency. Now I'll show you another experiment we did. We took advantage of a uh, interesting group of uh, patients that we had that had functional tremor that uh, actually had their functional tremor when they put their arm in a certain position. So they put their arm in a certain position and then they would have their tremor. Um, but they could also mimic that voluntarily. So they could put their arm in that position and they could voluntarily do it. Both circumstances looked the same. The only difference was one was voluntary and one was involuntary. Okay? And so we did this experiment then. Uh, you see it was published uh, a number of years ago uh, along with an editorial. And um, the question is, is what is the difference between involuntary tremor and voluntary tremor? And uh, there were eight patients, uh, MRI compared the two, I've already told you that. So this is, this is what we saw. And uh, the biggest area of hypoactivity in the uh, functional MR uh, was the right temporoparietal junction. So just this, uh, this same region that has to do with agency is uh, hypoactive uh, in, in, these, uh, in these patients compared, uh, comparing their voluntary and involuntary action. The other thing is that uh, that was hypoactive and there was some hyperactivity uh, in various prefrontal areas, um, which you see here. A little smattering of increased activity in the anterior cingulate, uh, the ventromedial prefrontal cortex um, that were increased in activity. Uh, we have uh, recently completed a resting state functional MRI study in uh, patients with functional movement disorders. And interestingly, even in the resting state, there is abnormal connectivity uh, from the right temporoparietal junction to other parts of the motor system. Uh, this, was, this was just published uh, last year. Uh, so there's a clear abnormality of the temporoparietal junction present at rest, present even with their voluntary movements, and way out of function with their involuntary movements. Another part of the story. Um, this is an old paper, um, single case, um, uh, that was the first one to look at uh, neuroimaging in functional paralysis. And uh, what, these, uh, what, what Marshall and colleagues did was to uh, look at what was activated in moving the normal arm, or moving the normal leg, and the trying to move the paralyzed leg. Of course, nothing happened when moving the paralyzed leg because it was paralyzed, but the question is, was there any activation to see? So in moving the, the normal leg, so here was paralysis of the left leg, this is for movement of the right leg, and all the right places in the brain are activated, the motor cortex, uh, supplementary motor area, cerebellum, all, all activated just as it should. Uh, in uh, trying to move the right leg, uh, sorry, in trying to move the left leg, of course, nothing was happening, but there was brain activation, and the brain activation was in the frontal uh, part of the brain, into this prefrontal uh, regions of the brain that were activated in that particular circumstance. Similar in a way to the overactivity that we saw in the patients with tremor that I just pointed out to you earlier. Show you another experiment. Um, this is a uh, uh, this is a, uh, a task where we wanted to activate the limbic system to see how it was operative in these patients. And um, we used what is uh, actually a relatively common functional MR uh, paradigm used, used a lot in psychiatry, uh, looking at emotional faces uh, to see uh, how the brain reacted to looking at these, uh, at these faces. So there were 16 patients with uh, what's, uh, yes, so I suppose I didn't say that we go back and forth between psychogenic movement disorders and functional movement disorders, so that's what PMD means. Functional is more commonly used now. It's an old slide, I guess. Okay, so uh, 16 patients, 16 controls, MRI. It's an in incidental effective task 
We used fearful, happy, and neutral faces, but the subjects were asked just to say whether they were male or female. They weren't asked to say anything about the emotional aspect of the face, just whether it was a male face or a female face. We didn't care about that. We just cared about how the brain reacted to the different emotions that were in the faces. Here's, here, here, here's an example of a fearful face, a happy face, and looked at the brain to see where there might be abnormalities. And uh, the main abnormality was in the right amygdala um, that was identified here. So that in uh, patients that, uh, or, or in healthy volunteers, there was, a, there was a big response in the amygdala for fearful faces, but almost nothing for happy faces, which is what you would expect. But in the patients, they had a similar response for happy and fearful faces. So uh, uh, an abnormal response in the, in the right amygdala. Um, the left amygdala uh, was not abnormal, but did correlate with the amount of depression that the patients had, which is what one sees in uh, patients that are depressed otherwise. Uh, but that, that wasn't where the problem was, it was in the right amygdala. And, um, and in fact, uh, there was a, a important correlation or connectivity between the right amygdala and the right supplementary motor area. So this gets us from the limbic system into the motor system in some way. Here we have connectivity between the uh, abnormal functioning limbic system and the motor system. We have uh, continued to be working in this area, uh, and I'll just show you a couple things that are, that, that are in preparation at the moment. Uh, we've been analyzing resting state functional MRI activity in these patients, uh, looking at a, a whole brain graph theory analysis of the MRI. Um, there's increased so-called betweenness centrality in a number of different regions. These are regions that are more important to, to the number of connections that are going on. That, that, that's what between this centrality is. More stuff is coming through that node on the brain. And one of those regions is in fact uh, uh, the tempro, uh, temporoparietal junction and uh, another uh, has to do with the amygdala. The right amygdala, again, is a critical spot uh, in just resting connectivity. And uh, uh, the, the other thing which is a bit funny in this circumstance, and I don't understand this completely, this at least of the resting state uh, as opposed to the active state that we saw before, there's decreased connectivity between the right amygdala and the supplementary motor area. So perhaps at rest it's decreased, and then when it's involved in an emotional task of some sort it becomes increased. But again, it's some abnormality in that particular connection. We're still finalizing these last two bits of information. The other thing, which again, one other, uh, one other observation, um, that we've just done uh, structural imaging as well as functional imaging in these patients. And uh, it, what we've seen is that there's some areas of gray matter increase in these patients. Uh, that's more prominent than decreases. And uh, one of the places that's abnormal is the left amygdala in these patients, not the right amygdala. Everything I've shown you so far is the right amygdala. Uh, again, we're trying to understand this at the moment. It may be that the left amygdala is trying to improve the limbic function since the right amygdala is not doing well. I don't know. Something the matter with the amygdala uh, on really both sides in these cases. All right, so I've shown you all the data I have, even stuff that is just, uh, that we're just working on at the moment. And uh, how do we put this all together at the moment? Uh, going, back to the, uh, going back to the scheme of how things work. Well, I've already told you that movement generation is normal. That, that appears to be normal. And uh, it looks like there may be excessive limbic activity that leads to movement generation. The, it, it does seem that the limbic system is overactive. It, is, it does have connections into the motor system. 
and that may be how the movements are generated. And then it is probable that a lack of feed-forward signaling uh, from this intentional module uh, leads to some confusion in the match of feed-forward and feedback, giving rise to abnormal function of the temporoparietal junction uh, in these cases. And that's why they don't have the sense of agency, because there's no proper match that is occurring here. So that's the way that uh, we interpret this at the moment. And interestingly, going back to the definition that I gave you before and, and Freud, um, the idea in, in his view was that the psychological disorders converted to, into the symptom. I, I think he would like this result. Uh, here we have an abnormal limbic drive on the motor system, which I think to some extent is uh, what he might have been saying if he <clears throat> knew how the system was organized as we do now. Um, so uh, functional movement disorders are a complex disorder, major importance, as I pointed out, 10% of patients that come into the office are this, fall into this category. I, I hope that I've proved to you that we're making some progress in the pathophysiology of these cases. And it uh, had been largely neglected, uh, but the area is uh, getting increased attention. The patients are being recognized, uh, but we need better treatments uh, for these patients. Uh, we still are having trouble uh, in that area. Uh, just a, a couple of points. If you, uh, I've, I've organized a couple of congresses in the past on what we used to call psychogenic movement disorders. And um, uh, these are books that came out of that uh, conference. Uh, and uh, this book has about 120 videotapes, uh, which I think are uh, helpful in terms of education about how to make the diagnosis on the patients. Um, this book has just been published about six months ago. Now, this, this covers the entire field of functional neurological disorders, not only movement disorders, but uh, the, whole, the whole range, visual disorders, psychogenic uh, epilepsy, which is, much, which is the most common type. So there's all, all sorts of things in this book. It's probably the first book that's ever been written about this. I mean, it's amazing, 10% of patients, and there's never been a book about it until now. But we've, we've solved that. And um, then if you're really interested, you could come to uh, the Edinburgh uh, Congress that we'll have later this, this year that will uh, try to bring everybody up to date on, on this disorder. Well, I want to finish by coming back to Eccles. Um, understanding disor disorders such as functional movement disorders help to understand the process of volition, which is this difficult uh, area, it's important area, uh, that, uh, that Eccles uh, struggled with. Um, and I think that the, the answer to the problem is that volition appears to be a perception of the brain uh, coming from this feed-forward feedback uh, situation. Um, and that's the way that I interpret this at the moment, so I don't run into a problem with the break between the idea and the motor system. But there's clearly more to learn, and uh, we'll have to keep on working. So thank you very much for your attention. I'll be happy to answer questions. clear and enlightening uh, talk. I have one question about pathophysiology and one about treatment. Uh, as we all know, uh, functional disorders may arise in patients having an organic uh, disorder, so to say. I mean, this is the case, for instance, for epilepsy, where patients may have, mm -hmm. let's say, true epileptic uh, seizures and then not uncommonly develop uh, pseudo seizures. So this would imply that there may be some learning mechanism involved in uh, the appearance of some 
functional disorder. So I was yeah. thinking about what. Right. So uh, right. So let me uh, right. So let me just comment on that uh, point. I um, I what I did is I gave you the physiological version of this talk, not the not the clinical version. So that's one of the things that I talk about in the clinical story. Um, these uh, these patients appear to mimic things that they know. Um, so that if you have an organic disorder uh, and you develop a functional disorder on top of it, you often mimic the organic disorder. And that's what uh, happens in the setting of seizures, that uh, patients that have functional seizures very often have organic seizures too. Patients that have multiple sclerosis, it's another common group of this sort. They have a whole variety of symptoms. They're very prone to functional symptoms which mimic what they've seen. Um, this is also the root of mass hysteria. So uh, if you have uh, someone that has a particular movement problem or some, something else uh, and other people come down with it in a functional way or have a functional tendency, they will mimic that. So uh, the, we just had an outbreak of Tourette syndrome in upstate New York in the United States. There was a girl there that had Tourette syndrome. Uh, something went wrong in the town, and 15 girls came down with Tourette syndrome in a matter of a week or two. We see families where this happens. Someone in the family has a disorder, and the children or whatnot mimic the, the mother. So uh, there are, that's probably how this arises, that there's, a, there's some sort of mimicry. Now, that's as, that's the clinical story. Exactly why it's happening, I don't know, but uh, there's certainly this mimicking that will occur in, in this population. The second question is about treatment. If uh, you imply, based on your observation, that there may be in hyperactivity or some kind of disconnective collaboration between the temporal, temporal um, parietal junction and the other areas, this would open the possibility of intervention, let's say uh, inhibiting intervention in the area as a potential treatment for these disorders. Any data supporting this? Right, so ask me next year and I'll tell you the answer to that question. <laughs> we are doing that now. <laughs> We're doing that now. I mean, I think that's, uh, that, is, that is something that deserves to be done and hopefully in a year or so we'll have an answer to that. So I'm not at all an expert, and I really appreciated the clarity of your, your expose. I, I think I understood something, but I have some questions. I, sure. So j first of all, I mean, the first is a very simple one. So is a tick something like, of the sort that if I have a pencil in front of me and I want to put it straight and parallel to the lines, and I, I mean, is this a kind of tick? If I do this all the time, I, is this a tick? I mean, I was just trying to understand what the definition is. I mean, if well, what I is a tick? Keep, if I keep doing this, I mean, uh, so a, want to keep things, you know, right. keep um, ordering things. Is this a, is uh -huh. a tick? So a, so a tick is a uh, movement that uh, individuals who, who have this particular problem do it, in fact, repetitively, often without thinking about it very much. But if you ask them about it, they will say that they are, that they are doing it voluntarily. Right. It is not a goal-directed movement oh, right. in any way. It, uh, the most common type of tick is actually blinking. Oh, okay. Uh, or head tilt, or head thrust, or something like that. Uh, so it, most of them are relatively simple type movements like that, not really goal directed. Uh, but how they arise is not clear, and it may well be that they are in part habit derived. Um, so that is that is a possible mechanism. That's uh, another area that we're working on, and. Uh, I, I believe that uh, there may be some element of habit in it, but in general that uh, would not be what is ordinarily considered. And then I have a question on the diagram. So you had a, a name for the feet back and the feet forward, and you had another arrow going from the movement generation down yep. to the... Sorry, did I just lose it? Oh, here. Uh, see if I can find that for you again. That was Eccles' diagram. We'll get it to my diagram. There we go. Yeah, so, so 
I was just wondering whether the feed forward is the name for the two arrows going into agency or right, it's right, the right. Arrows. So they are they are they are feed forward signals. So right. that uh, oh, but it's the two. So of them. that they are, so that uh, uh, so the actual movement hasn't occurred yet. The movement's here. Sure. So these are both happening prior to the movement, and they're uh, they're saying that the brain is beginning to initiate the command to make the movement, or actually making the command to give the movement. It warns the brain uh, that a movement may be coming. Then, if everything goes well, movement actually comes. Yeah, and of course, you, I mean, you are very, I mean, in a sense, modest. I mean, talking about volition is something, you know, philosophically very important. But I guess, uh, I mean, movement is very important to, I mean, you would think that movement is basic to understand what agency is, right? I mean, you, you probably are. That's one, is this one of the reasons why you're interested in, in movement in particular? Well, how did I get interested in this uh, area? Uh, well, uh, I guess I got interested in it um, be, uh, about probably 15 years or so ago. Um, we have a clinic at the National Institutes of Health where we see patients that are problematic to other doctors. And so the patients come. And I realized at one point that about 20% of our patients had functional neurological disorders. I looked to see the literature, there was none, zero. Uh, functional neurological disorders actually disappeared from neurology textbooks. Uh, it disappeared from psychiatry training. They said, well, no one's looking at this. 20% of my patients have this. It might be worth looking into. And then as you begin looking, the problem of volition becomes apparent. And then I got more, well, it's an interesting problem, but I got interested in volition in part because of this. Yeah. Uh, two questions, maybe. Yes, I, I join in, uh, in the praise of the presentation that is very, very clear. Uh, two things, I mean, the cerebellum is completely out of this. I mean, uh, you didn't mention it because it's not involved at all. And the second well, okay. So, uh, uh, well, the cerebellum is involved in movement generation, and uh, in that I will agree with Eccles completely, uh, because uh, yeah, yeah, I mean that is I mean uh, this is a very simplified diagram, and uh, the cerebellum is a major player in movement generation. And the second question is, uh, let's uh, not assuming. I mean, you you do have evidence that there is a. a, a uh, a real uh, um, pathology or, or whatever, a real change in the substrate, in the functional substrate of the movement generation. If you confront the patient with that, uh, do you think that has a therapeutic uh, potential? Would, uh, uh, would be beneficial to the patient to know it? Or... Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, right, so there is a theme at the moment in therapy that was um, first, I think, probably demonstrated by John Stone and Mark Edwards, in which they have decided to uh, uh, show the patients exactly the abnormal uh, movement phenomenon of which they've used to make the diagnosis. So, for example, entrainment. Uh, after going through the whole history and whatnot, they'll sit down with the patient, you have a functional tremor. How do I know that? In part, because you remember when we did this, your arm went to a different frequency. This is what we see in functional tremors. And they have felt that this is helpful. Um, so I think that people are beginning to do that. Uh, but whether that's going to be useful in general in the long run is uh, certainly remains to be seen. But that is a theme in the current therapy at the moment. Mark, still the question arises then if you do, in my experience, that you start saying, you see, it is normal. The question will arise right after, so what do I have then? So in a way, uh -huh. showing that basic mechanism are normal still does not fulfill the need of the patient for some explanation. Right, so, what I mean? yes, right. So uh, uh, what we, do in that circumstance is uh, basically tell them that the brain is dysfunctional, functional movement disorder. The brain is not functioning correctly. 
It's like a software problem. It's not a hardware problem. The brain is okay. The connections are all there, just that the software is not working right. And it, when we tell them this is a significant problem, you don't have nothing. I think one of the problems is, is that a lot, of, a lot of neurologists will see these patients and say, there's nothing the matter with you. Go, go back and make yourself better. That has been probably 80% of what happens when a, neuro when a neurologist sees these patients. They can't make themselves better just by, just by doing it. But you have to agree with them, which is true, that uh, this is a significant disability. The prognosis has been poor. Um, but it's possible to, to, to help you. But the brain is badly malfunctioning at the moment. You don't have nothing. You have a significant problem. Uh, yes, thank you very much for um, your presentation. So about to the last uh, slide on uh, the overstimulation of amygdala and uh, the last slide. So you want to go back to? Uh, last, last, uh, last study, yes. The last one? Um, want to go back to? Yes, uh, back. This? Yeah. Um, uh, no, no, just uh, one back. So my question is, uh, uh, if uh, you think that, the, the, uh, yes, this, this, this one? one, yes, if you think that uh, the serotoninergic pathway can be involved uh, in uh, this uh, connection between amygdala and putamen and caudato, and in that case, if you see in patients some overstimulation of uh, dorsal nucleus of Rafa. Yeah, so uh, exactly uh, how this is put together, uh, yet yeah, I, I, again, I'm, I'm showing you the, the work that we're doing that's, that, that is in progress. What we've been doing um, for the last six years is to have a good series of these patients, bringing them into the hospital, doing about two days' worth of examinations and imaging and whatnot. I've shown you the functional imaging. Uh, results. This is some of the voxel-based morphometry. We also have diffusion tensor imaging, and I think that that will look at somewhat of uh, the pathways, I mean the structural pathways. We already have some of the functional pathways that we understand. But uh, looking, looking at this, uh, this, is, this, is, this is again limbic system. These are, uh, well, yeah, I, I asked uh, Corrine Moore is the current fellow working on this. She's doing a very good job. Last time I met with her, I said, is this the dorsal medial thalamus? I, I hope it is the dorsal medial thalamus. She has to, she has to look up the coordinates of this. But if, if that's the case, that's, uh, that's also limbic uh, then in, in nature. I, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, Putamen, uh, this is the posterior part of the putamen, uh, the motor system again. So we have the motor system and the limbic system interacting in ways and exactly how it's going to be doing it. Uh, we'll be grinding out more data about this. Okay, I have some questions. Alessandro from Neuroradiology, we just met, but thank you. Very, very fascinating lecture, of course. Uh, Again, one uh, just a cu curiosity about the treatment of these functional disorders. Am I wrong that you said about the lady that had a 20 years history of functional tremor that she was cured uh, rapidly after the diagnosis? Or? No, she, uh, she wasn't cured rapidly. It took about six months. But uh, she went into psychotherapy, psychotherapy. Uh, with uh, a, a very experienced psychiatrist in New York City, Dan Williams, uh, who has done a lot of work with these patients over the years. And in about six months, she was cured. The woman who uh, had the myoclonus, uh, she had had it two weeks only at the time we saw her. And in another maybe 10 days, she was cured. So the earlier you, you can uh, get these patients, probably the prognosis is better. Um, but uh, yes, uh, 20 years of tremor and took about six months. Okay, thank you. And about these functional studies, is it clinical observation enough to make all the precise diagnosis or these studies will have a future in uh, uh, reaching finer diagnosis, more precise diagnosis, stratifying different types of patients mm -hmm. in the future on an individual basis? Right, so I think uh, clinically you can do very well, uh, but not completely. Uh, 
So uh, we often do physiology to be, to be helpful. So we, uh, for patients with myoclonus, we are often doing Breitschaft potential recording. We're looking at stimulus response latencies uh, in those patients. We're looking for entrainment because it isn't always as obvious as it is in that particular woman. So we use physiology a lot. Uh, imaging, uh, I think in general abnormal only at a group level at this point. We don't have anything in imaging that's going to be a single case. Now once you go out of movement disorders, then there are different things in different areas. Um, the, again, the most common are functional seizures, and the gold standard there is video EEG monitoring. And uh, is there an epileptologist in the house that will tell us about that? But about 50% of patients or 60% of patients that undergo video EEG monitoring are actually functional. That seems to be the characteristics uh, worldwide. So this is very common, but the video EEG is extremely helpful in that circumstance. Uh, then there are tricks in ophthalmology for blindness, and there's all sorts of things that, uh, that people do. So I think clinical gets you a long way. Um, there are other tricks that are sometimes helpful. Imaging at this point is not helpful on a single basis, on a single case basis. One last one, question, if I may. You have, you have talked about mimicking that makes a part of uh, these functional disorders. Have you found, or there is report that medical doctors that have more complex uh, functional disorders to diagnose because they, they mimic you yeah. know, in a more uh, sophisticated way? <laughs> So uh, it is the case that if you uh, look at the clinical literature, you will see that one of the things that predisposes to functional disorders is being in the medical profession. Um, we have had a large number of doctors uh, with this particular disorder, a fair number of nurses who have, uh, who have had this particular difficulty. And it may well be that uh, that is the reason that doctors and nurses see these types of conditions and therefore when they have a psychological problem, mimic the types of things that they, that they see. So uh, yes, you, you will, it is thought that people in the health profession have a higher propensity for this than non-medical people. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. We have to, to move uh, ahead. I would like to, to thank you just to make one, maybe one final uh, comment. As you say, the, the neurologist forgot this disease, the psychiatric forgot this disease, because uh, very often in the medicine, when you have a big problem, you are just hiding it. And because we had no explanation, we had no concept. And now I think with the concept of agency, there is like a, a little revolution. I think that we still need a better therapy. I'm not sure if the Psychotherapy we are using now, it's really the best treatment, but uh, uh, I, I, mean, I don't know, maybe the, the, the very last comment. Well, physical therapy, I think, is useful too. Uh, I think that in many of these patients, it's a combination of psychotherapy and physical therapy was actually necessary. Again, I didn't go into the clinical details here, but I think that the current evidence in terms of psychotherapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, it seems to have the best, uh, the best use at the moment. And in many patients, they definitely need uh, physical therapy, social work, whole variety of multidisciplinary care. This is the only way really to deal with the cases. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So I switch back to Italian now. Siamo, uh, siamo adesso alla seconda parte della, del simposio. È un uh, compito un po' difficile di fare l'introduzione di Stefania Scoi perché uh, sono uh, naturalmente coinvolto nel, nel lavoro uh, scientifico. Uh, Stefania Scoi ha incominciato il suo lavoro di, uh, di dottorato a Berna con me. Uh, Quattro, quattro, più di quattro anni fa, 
è venuta con me in, in Ticino e alla uh, fine 2015 era il, il primo PhD in neuroscienze dato in, in Ticino dall'Università di Berna, perché non c'è ancora, ma uh, naturalmente come anche adesso come professore uh, di ruolo dell'Università della Svizzera Italiana, vogliamo che i prossimi PhD in neuroscienze siano dell'Università dell anche della Svizzera Italiana. Il problema è che sono anche nel comitato scientifico della Fondazione Neuroscienze eh, Ticino e questo naturalmente dà l'impressione che ho aiutato la mia doc, dottoranda e postdoc a, a ricevere il premio. Vorrei veramente dire che non ho aperto la bocca, non ho detto niente, quest'anno veramente non ho contribuito per niente. E, e la gente che sceglie è della gente soprattutto fuori del Ticino, eh, per esempio il professor Aguzzi di, eh, di, eh, di Zurigo. E anche per ciò che sono naturalmente molto molto eh, lieto che eh, Stefania eh, Sgroi ha vinto questo, questo premio, questo, questo eh, riconoscimento. E un po una, siamo sembra essere lontano di ciò che abbiamo eh, sentito adesso, eh, ciò che abbiamo sentito è veramente la, la ricerca, come si può capire meglio il funzionamento del cervello umano, ma rimane che per altre domande nella malattia di Parkinson, nei problemi della malattia di Parkinson, abbiamo bisogno dei modelli eh, animali. E nel nostro eh, laboratorio di neuroscienze eh, trasla traslazionale, la ricerca traslazionale nella malattia di Parkinson è una delle, delle priorità. Uh, sotto la direzione di, di Paolo Paganetti, ci sono anche altri, altri ricercatori come uh, Salvatore Galati, abbiamo, abbiamo la voglia di capire meglio le malattie uh, neurologiche e di fare una ricerca traslazionale per alla fine uh, aiutare il, uh, il paziente. E mi fa naturalmente molto piacere se il comitato scientifico uh, ha scelto un, un articolo che va uh, in uh, questa uh, direzione e prego Stefania Scroi di presentare il suo eh, lavoro che è stato premiato dalla Fondazione Neuroscienze Ticino. Okay, um, thank you very much, Professor Kelly. Thanks uh, for being here, and mainly thanks uh, to Scientific Committee uh, of uh, Neuroscience Foundation of Ticino for uh, giving me this uh, award. It's very important for my scientific career, so thank you very much uh, uh, for this opportunity. Uh, today, I, uh, I am here, and I have the pleasure to show you my um, my work that we published in Experimental Neurology in 2016. I started this work uh, in Bern, then I complete uh, uh, in the laboratory of uh, biomedical neuroscience uh, here in Ticino. Okay, so uh, briefly, uh, nothing. Okay. So as you know, Parkinson's disease is a neurodegenerative disorder due to a loss of dopaminergic cells in the substantia negra pars compacta. Here you can see a difference between a normal state with a presence of uh, uh, these dopaminergic cells and the absence of uh, these cells in a Parkinsonian state. Parkinson's disease is also associated to an aggregation of, uh, of alpha-synuclein protein which are also responsible for the classical symptoms of Parkinson's disease. That uh, you can see listed uh, here as bradykinesia, hypokinesia, and resting tremor. But how is possible to recreate a Parkinsonian state in animal model? In our lab, uh, we can uh, use uh, as a method the injection of uh, 6-hydroxydopamine toxin that uh, we can inject uh, unilaterally into the medial forebrain bundle in order to destroy the dopaminergic projection from the substantia negra pars compacta to striatum. 
that is responsible also in animal model of classical symptoms of Parkinson's disease. For example, the first sign that we can see in animal model is the, ipsil is the spontaneous ipsilateral torsion of the rat body to the side of a toxin injection and the inability of the animal to turn controlaterally, controlaterally due to the loss of dopaminergic cells. Moreover, if the animals uh, are underwent to uh, locomotor test, they show an, a typical reduction of motor activity as a sign of bradykinesia and akinesia respect to a normal exploratory behavior in healthy condition. The, uh, the loss of dopaminergic cells can be quantified by uh, analysis of tyrosine hydroxylase, which is an enzyme responsible for the synthesis of dopamine into the brain. And you can see in this, in this picture, we have a lesion side, uh, an intact side with the presence in gray of tyrosine hydroxylase at the lack of this protein into the dopaminergic axon terminal of the striatum as a sign of a correct depletion of dopamine. But as you know, Parkinsonian symptoms can be uh, counteracted in humans by uh, levodopa treatment, which is the best and useful drug to provide exogenous uh, um, dopamine into the brain. Indeed, uh, under L-DOPA treatment, the imbalance between the direct and indirect pathway is uh, reversed. And uh, under L-DOPA treatment, we have an overstimulation of the direct pathway that promotes the thalamocortical projection in order to activate movement. However, after a long time L-DOPA treatment, the, uh, the patients start to develop this, the common uh, complication, which is a dyskinesia, also called, uh, also defined as abnormal involuntary movement. And also in animal model, we can recreate uh, this uh, dyskinetic movement under chronic L-DOPA treatment. However, there are uh, three important motor aspects and uh, motor complications uh, that develop in animal model under chronic dopa treatment. And in a previous study, we uh, was able to characterize uh, this motor complication and uh, um, we used this behavioral data, data then to complete uh, the awarded um, study that was published last year in experimental neurology. So, um, uh, um, based on a different behavioral approach, we was able to first study the prokinetic and akinetic effect of L-DOPA treatment uh, through an accurate analysis of locomotor activity in on and off phases of L-DOPA treatment, meaning that the animals perform locomotor activity in the on phase uh, that's uh, when levodopa has uh, a maximum of the effect and in off phase we, we, we have an akinetic effect because uh, levodopa wears off. Then uh, we look at, uh, at the sarking behavior of animals. The sarking behavior in animals is uh, defined as a contralateral rotation of the animal to the side of toxin injection. And uh, that's only appear in animals, but not in humans. And the circling behavior in general is defined as an overstimulation, an oversensitization of the lesion side to dopaminergic treatment. Moreover, we was also able, according to literature, to assess the severity and the frequency of this kinetic movement also here defined as in human according to the uh, bodily distribution of this kinetic movement. Indeed, we can distinguish three types of this kinetic movement. The axial part due to uh, a torsion of the neck, the orolingual part due to the protrusion of tongue and jaw opening, and then the forelimb uh, movement due to the constant movement of uh, the repetitive movement of a forelimb. 
However, several studies try to understand the neural mechanism that control or, to, or that can be responsible for uh, the motor complication of levodopa treatment, in particular a uh, dyskinetic movement. But uh, the difficulty to find a solution is uh, due to the high number of neurotransmitter neuromodulator that control the output transmission of basal ganglia. And uh, among these uh, neurotransmitter and neuromodulator, uh, we paid strong attention for the opiodergic system, and in particular the endogenous opiodergic neuropeptide and kephaline and dynorphin, which are uh, expressed into the GABAergic uh, uh, neurons of the striatum in order to control differently the activation of the indirect and uh, direct pathway, for, uh, for, uh, of course, for uh, uh, the control of movement. So encephaline and dynorphin are uh, uh, co-transmitter with the inhibitory activity. They are produced by proteolytic cleavage from uh, uh, their precursors pre-proencephaline and uh, pro-dynorphin. And while the encephaline bind the delta and mu opioid receptors, which are most express, expressed into the indirect pathway, on the other hand, the dynorphine bind, bind the, uh, the kappa receptors, which are expressed into the direct part. Moreover, we have a different uh, also expression of uh, encephaline and dynorphine in Parkinsonia state compared to uh, this kinetic state uh, that uh, I will show uh, in, um, 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 in, in briefly. And then there is a, a synergic uh, relationship between the opiodergic system and the dopaminergic system in the control of movement. And that's what exactly we investigate in this paper, where the aim was to uh, quantify the mRNA expression of uh, uh, precursors of opiodergic neuropeptide and kephaline and dynorphine in three groups of animals. And then we correlate the level of these uh, mRNA RNA expression with the behavioral response uh, that we previously analyzed in the same animals. So as you can see in this uh, slide, so these graphs represent the uh, quantification of uh, mRNA expression for preproencephaline and prodynorphine in three groups of experimental animals. One group uh, was treated, uh, um, uh, one group was a, a Parkinsonian, uh, um, composed by Parkinsonian animals uh, treated with uh, Aldopa for 21 days. This one is a, a Parkinsonian group treated with saline, which represents as our um, control group. And then we have an, a third group composed by completely healthy animals just treated with L-DOPA in order to assess the effect of L-DOPA excluding the Parkinsonian state. So we analyze and quantify the MRN expression into the lesion and the intact side. This one, uh, this, uh, these are um, the autoradiogram showing the expression of uh, preproencephaline and prodynorphine in the striatal region. And then we also look at, uh, at the difference of expression between the medial and the lateral part of the striatum, which have a different, a different role, a different functional um, role in the control of movement. So as you can see, for uh, the expression of preproencephaline, we have uh, an increase of uh, mRNA expression in both group treated with saline and uh, L-DOPA, more uh, into the lesion side compared to the intact side, without any difference between the lateral in gray and the medial in black region of striatum. Meaning, meaning that the increase of preproencephaline is uh, due to a Parkinsonian state is due to a dopaminergic denervation and not a dopa treatment. On the contrary, if we look at the expression of prodynorphine, we have a significant increase only in the PD group treated with L-DOPA, 
also here uh, with the difference between uh, a lesion uh, um, side uh, versus uh, um, intact side. But here we have a strong difference between in the lateral expression versus to the medial expression, as also shown into the, out, uh, into the outer radiogram, where the lateral part is uh, darker than the medial part. Meaning that for the increase of prodynorphin, is, uh, um, so th that the increase of prodynorphin is uh, only due to the L-DOPA treatment and not uh, Parkinsonian state, and not only Parkinsonian state. Finally, if we look at the correlation between the expression of uh, mRNA and uh, the behavioral data observed in a previous study in the same animals, so we can see that uh, an increase of preproencephaline correlates significantly with an increase of dyskinetic movement when also the rotational score, which is a, um, which is a score to um, quantify the circling controlateral behavior, is included in the analysis. And also here, if you look, we have a correlation between preproencephaline mRNA and increase of uh, Controlateral rotation, uh, which are a sign of uh, hypersensitivity of a lesion site to dopaminergic treatment. Moreover, we also have uh, a, st a correlation between the increase of encephaline and uh, the velocity mean, which is uh, a locomotor variables uh, assessing during the on phase of L DOPA treatment uh, as uh, hyperactivity of the animals during uh, drug uh, um, delivery. On the contrary, if we look at the correlation with the prodynorphin, the mRNA only correlates with the dyskinetic movement, but without including the rotational score. And no other, and not any other um, correlation was found between the prodynorphin and the locomotor activity or uh, a circling behavior. So in conclusion, uh, we confirm that the Parkinsonian state uh, and the dyskinetic state show a, a different expression in the mRNA for preproencephaline and prodynorphin, also with the difference between a medial and that a lateral region into the striatum. Then, moreover, we observed for the first time that the uh, increase of preproencephaline mRNA is uh, associated with uh, a prokinetic effect of L-DOPA, promoting uh, probably a locomotor hypersensitivity of the system to dopaminergic treatment while uh, the prodynorphin only correlates uh, with the dyskinetic movement without an involvement in locomotor activity. So finally, we can uh, suggest, indicate, that uh, the endogenous opiodergic neuropeptide could be differently involved in the behavioral response induced by L-DOPA treatment. And uh, our study paved the, paved the way uh, to start a future pharmacological approach with the selective antagonist of opioid, recept uh, of opioid receptors in order to reduce the hypersensitivity and the hyper response of the system to dopamine treatment and maybe a dyskinetic movement. I want to thank uh, the people that uh, help, um, help me during uh, this uh, work. First, of course, my boss, Professor Alan Kellin, then uh, uh, Dr. Paolo Paganetti, which is, uh, uh, who is a chief of the lab uh, in the laboratory for uh, biomedical neuroscience in Taverne, and finally, uh, Dr. Kapper Loop, um, who um, helped me when I was in uh, Bern. And uh, of course, thank you everybody for your attention. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Stefania, for the it's a clear good presentation. We are a little bit late, maybe just one time for one question. Maybe just one comment from myself. We, 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 oh, sorry. Where is the? Uh, very nice uh, work in this regard, drawing, drawing attention to the other important neurotransmitters in, this, in the system. 
Do you have any evidence for actual causality, however, as opposed to just association? Uh, could there be something else that would be responsible for this? For example, uh, I don't know what ordinarily drives the amount of dynorphin there, if it's the amount of activity or other types of input that might alter it. Might it just then be a correlation as opposed to a causal event? Um, yes, I mean, uh, we also um, uh, we also start uh, um, an, a study with the pharmacological approach to, to better understand uh, uh, why. And uh, the idea is uh, uh, that we have uh, an alteration in the, post in the postsynaptic transmission due to activation of this opiodergic system. In particular, the idea is uh, that uh, uh, the encephalinergic transmission is uh, activated uh, before uh, uh, given L-DOPA, meaning uh, when uh, we have a Parkinsonian state, and uh, um, the activation of this system uh, through uh, postsynaptic um, uh, response uh, can maintain uh, the, the system upregulated uh, in order to respond uh, immediately with uh, an hyperactivity to L-DOPA, to a future L-DOPA treatment. That's uh, because uh, uh, this uh, um, increased level of uh, encephaline are uh, in off phase of L-DOPA treatment, uh, meaning that after chronic treatment, uh, we stop it, and then uh, we sacrifice the animals and see what happens one day after last uh, L-DOPA. And uh, the level are increased. So that's uh, our idea, that the postsynaptic, uh, uh, postsynaptic response can uh, act during a Parkinsonian state and then uh, responds immediately when uh, we give uh, L-DOPA. Yeah, maybe, maybe just, uh, just one comment. You are, of course, right. We have to wait for the, for the pharmacological results, but our, uh, our, uh, we, we couldn't find such good correlation with other systems, and we think that the opioidergic system, which is seen as a pain, the system in reality could be a, a strong modulator of plasticity also in the, in the motor system. Okay, now we are coming to the very last part, giving the award. I will... Ecco bene, siamo arrivati alla fine. Eh, le due fondazioni eh, che hanno eh, così permesso questa serata con il Neurocentro possono essere molto soddisfatte. La nostra motivazione è quella di promuovere la scienza eh, eh, nell'ambito neurologico, nelle neuroscienze, la cultura, la comunicazione e credo che oggi abbiamo avuto una bellissima dimostrazione di quello che sono le neuroscienze. Eh, dalla loro importanza, abbiamo visto che ci sono dei disturbi mal conosciuti che toccano il 20% della popolazione, abbiamo visto di come anche la neuroscienza clinica abbia una sua complessità, ma come anche gli strumenti siano presenti per tentare di risolvere questa complessità per arrivare poi a una soluzione per i pazienti, ma credo che abbiamo visto anche qualcosa che mi sembra molto importante. Abbiamo visto eh, due oratori, evidentemente un grande professore dagli Stati Uniti, ma anche una giovanissima dottoressa eh, 
che viene dall'Italia ma che ha studiato in Svizzera, siamo in Ticino, eh, abbiamo un professore che viene dalla Svizzera francese, un ticinese che è fuori. Ecco, el, ho un grandissimo piacere nel vedere così questo fermento e anche questa convergenza di azioni, di culture, di collaborazioni e per cui ecco, vorrei che rimanesse questa, questa, questo ricordo di un pomeriggio con questa moltitudine di di convergenze e mi sembra anche estremamente promettente per il futuro della giovane facoltà di medicina e mi resta l'augurio che questo momento e anche questa vitalità che, che scaturisce da quello che tu stai facendo con chi è qui e chi ti ha raggiunto possa svilupparsi oltre e portare a nuovi successi. Sono molto contento, sono molto anche orgoglioso di quello che si fa e che stai facendo e dunque il mio miglior augurio è che questo sia non l'inizio, la continuazione, ma l'apertura di una nuova fase ancora più, più importante e più di successo. Grazie e buona serata.